Now we'll go into the second application of immuno in terms of taking what we learned in the first part of our discussions and applying that to clinical vignettes. So the second part is, starting with the first question is, 30 year old male pre presents to the emergency department with difficulty breathing and abdominal pain. So that's pretty generic, so it's not really very specific at this point. But on examination you notice diffuse areas of non-pitting edema with the predilection of the face. Okay, so he's got edema in the face. His lips are swollen. What would you most likely find in the complement analysis of this patient's blood? So the best thing to do a lot of times with these questions is to make the diagnosis. And then they're going to ask you, for example, some uh, pathology or some pathogenesis of that particular diagnosis. So you got a guy with swollen lips, swollen face, non-pitting edema, I'm thinking he has angioedema. Now it's just a matter of answering the question of what's the mechanism of angioedema. And so go through uh, the answers and number C looks quite good. You have low C1 esterase inhibitor, which is really the definition of angioedema, and low C4. Why the low C4 is because if you are not essentially, if you don't have that inhibitor, you're just going to continue to activate complement. And by activating that classical complement, you're going to use up your C4. So if you remember uh, how that system works in terms of classical complement, just to review very quickly, is you had 14, 23, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? And so this uh, C1 esterase is what's going to split this uh, QRS complex of C1 and then you're going to eventually start to go into and split these and you get uh, eventually your uh, your C3 convertase between these guys that are going to end up giving you your C3B okay C3B and C3A so as you might imagine as you can see right there you're going to use up that C4 because nothing is going to inhibit this from continuing to act and again you're going to keep you're going to keep activating complement so you're going to get that edema and uh, this can be a life-threatening situation number two is in the patient above what is mediating the edema and the answer there is going to be A the vasoactive peptides C3A and C5A so as we talked about with regard to this classical complement pathway like we just looked at you get the anaphylatoxin C4A, C3A and C5A and those are going to act on the mast cells right so the mast cells have the receptors for C5A all right and then that's going to cause you to secrete histamine from the mast cells. If you look at the other answer, eosinophils, what are they associated with? Parasitic infections as well as any kind of uh, IgE mediated allergy like we talked about before. Those are going to be recruited in the event of, a, um, in the event of an allergic reaction. Macrophages, they're going to be recruited to the site with IL-8 would be uh, one thing and also neutrophils would be recruited by your C5A is a chemotactic for neutrophils. And prepared, and that stabilizes, if you recall, the alternative complement pathway. And we're clearly talking about the classical pathway. C3 convertase, if you review what that does is, that's that, that piece, the C3 convertase in the classical pathway, where you get 4B, right? Um, we had 14... 23 right so you had the the c3 convertase acting right here and that's going to split the 3a uh, or 3 into 3a and 3b and remember the 3b sits on sits on the bad guy and the complement and their macrophages have a receptor complement receptor 1 on the macrophages which enables them to opsonize. The next question is what is an idiotype? It's just more or less a, a, definition, uh, a definition that sometimes you might see on a test question. It's probably not particularly high yield but um, if you go through the answers there uh, A says it's an antigenic determinant that appear only on the fab fragments. Okay so Remember we talk about isotypes, well though there's idiotypes. The isotypes, if you look in an antibody, okay, so you've got, this portion is the fab portion. Remember how we talked about fab nab, I always think of fab nab because this is the portion that's going to essentially bind to the bad guy, 
okay? And then this isotype switching, right, where you've got, you know, your heavy chain, you got your light chain, this isotype switching. So, so that is not, if you switch, for example, from IgM to IgG or IgE or IgA, you're not going to change this portion here this portion in the fab region, which is part of the idiotype. Okay, so don't confuse idiotype. Uh, like I say, don't be, Shalene, don't be an idiot, uh, idiot, don't confuse idiotype with isotype. Okay, this part right here is not going to change if you isotype switch, whereas you, you're going to get a, a switching of the heavy chain, uh, not this combination of the idiotype. So the answer to that question is going to be um, actually Yes, true. A, antigenic determinant that appear only on the fab fragments here. And then the other part that's uh, actually true as well is if it's bound with an anti idiotype anti seri uh, which is anti-anti, which sounds a little confusing, it's capable of blocking reactions with an appropriate haptin. So remember what a haptin is, is a haptin is a protein that is not big enough in its of itself to promote an antigenic response, an immuno response. So he piggybacks, so he's a little guy, and he piggybacks on a bigger protein. Okay, so this is the haptin. And then it becomes essentially an epitope. And an epitope, well, I mean, it has the effect of an epitope. <clears throat> and an epitope is going to bind. Um, you know, to this peritope area. This isn't important per se, but I'm just trying to explain to you um, where the word haptin comes from. So where this is used is, is sometimes in some drug therapies, particularly in tumor uh, therapy, they're still trying to work this out. So the reason why they go through it is just so that you're familiar with this term. So the answer to the question is uh, actually E, both A and D above. Number four is your patient is suffering from chronic inflammatory uh, bowel condition. All right, so again, we're thinking too much or not enough. Okay, so it's chronic inflammatory condition that's too much immunity. So have that in the back of your mind. Now, you recommend a new therapy that actually infects your patient with a parasite. Okay, now the, ther the theory behind why are you intentionally infecting your patient with a parasite? Uh, will help resolve your patient's gastrointestinal problems is what? So essentially, this is just sort of one of those, uh, it's a way of asking a cytokine question. Actually, I was told this um, by, a, uh, by a dean of a medical school one time. And the answer is essentially, let's go through them. A, parasites will cause a class switch to IgA. No, that's not true. Okay, that IgA class switching has to do with the, uh, mucosal immunity. Okay, so that doesn't have to do with parasites. B, parasites will cause a switch from Th1 response, causing uh, inflammation to a Th2 response. And that actually is true. Parasites will induce a Th2 response. Because remember, the usual suspects for dealing with parasites are going to be Th2 cytokines. And let's just go through those where we get a chance to do that because it's always fun to re review our favorite cytokines. So remember TH2 response. How do we get from, so you go TP to uh, T sub O, sorry. Okay. And then we could either go to TH1, which I, as you can tell, is my personal favorite, or you go to TH2. All right, and this guy is going to be by L4, and this is going to be by interferon gamma. This is just a review. We've, we've gone over this. But the cytokines are, remember the, the little mnemonic, you know, that I use is that's 10, uh, 4, good buddy, thank God, it's Friday the 13th, okay, um, IL-13, and you also get, five and six is a part of this. You can say six pack if you're into alcohol and Friday. Um, I don't know, five is not really Friday, but it works for me. Um, in any case, so let's look at this. So remember about parasites, IL-4 is going to isotype switch to IgE, right? And so the IgE, as you recall, is, due for, is uh, helpful in parasites. And then, oh, looky here, eosinophils is, is IL-4. Five. Okay, so you can see where the parasites are clearly in this family of Th2 cytokines. So you don't get this massive autoinflammation where you've got Th1, interferon gamma, TNF, 
where you're getting maso, massive proliferation of macrophages, all right? Um, and by the way, interferon gamma is called a macrophage activating factor. So that, that basically eggs those macrophages to keep fighting, to keep secreting cytokines, to keep going into the tissues. So that's, the, that's a long-winded answer, but it's a very uh, fundamental question to understanding the whole sort of differentiation between the two types of cytokines. Number five is your patient has repeated infections with candida albicans and respiratory viruses since she was three months old. Which of the following vaccines would be contraindicated? So you got to kind of figure out what type of, of immunodeficiency does she have? This is clearly immunodeficiency. Um, so candida albicans is actually, you need a cell mediated response for this. And so in this case, um, you got to have a cell mediated response so she you know you're not going to want to give her something that is going to require uh that is going to require your immune system to react to a pathogen i.e you don't want to give somebody with cell mediated uh, deficiency a live vaccine similarly you'd never give a live vaccine to an hiv patient anytime i think of cell mediated immune deficiency i think of the mother of all cell mediated immune deficiencies which is hiv um, and so in this case, which one of these is a live vaccine? BCG, yes, that's a live vaccine. Um, and not listed here, which are live, which we talked about, Sabin, Baricella, measles, mumps, rubella is also a live vaccine, um, but they're not listed. So A is the correct answer. Number six is, in the patient above, which of the following types of immunity is most likely deficient? And we just talked about it, essentially, that it's, it's going to be your cellular immunity, your T-cell immunity. And again, sometimes if you know one piece of information, like the fact that HIV, a lot of times you have candidiasis. In fact, uh, esophageal candidiasis is one of the uh, def AIDS-defining lesions, if you will. So you can kind of think back to that might jog your mind that, in fact, that is um, cell-mediated versus innate immunity with regard to this particular patient. Number seven is, uh, uh, well, let's go through... Um, these immunodeficiencies in number six, just to be clear about it. So if you had an innate immunity deficiency, you would probably have issues with uh, something like NADPH oxidase, so you wouldn't be able to fight Staph aureus. We'll talk more about that. Uh, if you had C cellular immunity with the B cell, you'd have a lot of bacterial infections. If you had lazy leukocytes, um, you, you know, again you would have more of a generalized immunodeficiency and if you had defective IgA we already talked about that you would have uh, GI problems and sinopulmonary infections. Number seven is in the laboratory experiment with knockout mice you observe the mice to be prone to bacteria, viral, fungal infections as well as some cancers. Okay so what is knocked out in the in the mice? Okay so these transgenic mice uh, I actually saw some the other day at the laboratory the human um, uh, Institute for Human uh, Virology at University of Maryland. They had this whole uh, room full of these knockout mice. It was pretty exciting. I wanted one for Christmas. But um, at any rate, they will pull out some key little uh, component of these little guys' immune system, and then they see, well, what happens now? So this guy, I mean, he's basically, uh, he's hurting. He can't fight anything. No bacteria, no viral, no fungal, and some cancers. So which of these would really uh, be sort of a pan immunodeficiency. Uh, so let's look at it. Number A is B7. You could have a 1, B7-2, CD80 test 86. Remember how we love to name things by 100 names, but it means the same thing. So let's just pretend that you have HIV because in this case, you do not have a T cell with your T cell receptor being presented something really delicious by the MHC class 2 molecule, but uh-oh, there's not the co-stimulatory molecule with your, uh, like I said, B7, CD8086, uh, yada, yada, um, with this CD28. So what does that mean? That means that you cannot mount a T-cell response in the story. So that, that answer actually looks quite attractive. Um, B is CD11. That's part of ICAM and firm adhesion. That's not going to take out every aspect of your immune system. CD40L, that's on the T-cell, that's isotype switching. 
again, that's going to be, you know, you would have too much IgM. It's not going to take out every aspect. And again, CD40 is the same thing, except for in terms of isotype switching, except for it's on the B cell. So the best answer is A. Now, number eight, your patient is prone to neoplasias due to immunosuppressing drugs taken after a liver transplant. That's one of the problems with these drugs is that you suppress your immune system so that you don't start uh, chewing up your new organ that you just got. But at the same time, your immune system does help you fight cancers. So this is the problem uh, with this particular patient. This is due in part to the loss of the following cytokine. So here we're trying, to, we're, all you got to do, you don't have to know anything about liver transplants. You don't have to know anything about much except for you need to know uh, which of these cytokines is a basically immunocompetent, like you get a really strong immune response to be able to eliminate things like a cytotoxic T cell type of a response, i.e. a TH1 response. So A is again uh, IL-4, that's just isotype switching, that's TH2, that's not very attractive. IL-5 is eosinophils, that's not going to kill cancer. Um, IL-10, that's the party pooper cytokine, that's going to shut down the TH1 response because remember it's going to inhibit you from, from ultimately getting interferon gamma. Oh looky, number D is interferon gamma. That sounds good. If you, um, in other words, if you lose your interferon gamma, you're not going to be able to, uh, you're not going to be able to push that TH1 response. And again, the TH1 response is going to increase a couple of things. We've already talked about one in terms of your interferon gamma and being a macrophage activating factor, but also your NK cells. They're a non-traditional T cell, but they're really good at killing tumor cells. And remember IL-2, which you would get an increase of if you did get a TH1 um, and you started pushing uh, this type of cytokine. Your NK cells, you're going to get this LAC, this uh, leukokine activated killer. All right, so that just makes it an even more competent killer in the presence of IL-2, which again, if you have the TH1 response. So the answer is D, interferon gamma. You deliver your first child, but the remnants of the, uh, the umbilical cord do not fall off in the appropriate time. What could be a possible cause of this? So this is a, one of those classic questions, but essentially if you think about the, the pathogenesis of it is that you have the umbilical cord and the cleanup crew is always going to be neutrophils and neut for anything, heart attacks, you name it, you know, the neutrophils are the first to the fight and they're going to chew up every, all the debris and then, you know, lead to other types of healing. But what's going to happen here is that that's not happening. The neutrophils can't somehow get to the fight. So what does that mean? That means more than likely that they can't diapodese into the, into the uh, tissue. So let's look at the answers. A defect in CD3, that's a T cell receptor. It makes no sense because we're talking about neutrophils, not T cells. B, a defect in CR1, that's a complement receptor. That's, again, not talking about neutrophils. That's talking about like opsonization or red blood cells have CR1, which enables them to haul off the immune complexes to the, uh, to the trash can in the spleen. Or C, a defect in calicrine. If you had a defect in calicrine, remember calicrine split C5 to C5A, you wouldn't be able to, um, you wouldn't be able to have uh, the sort of reaction the vasopermeability. Or D, a defect in CD11. A dash uh, CD18. Yes, that is the ICAM molecule um, on the endothelium that enables the macrophages and immune cells uh, and neutrophils to stick. Question 11 Your patient is suffering from autoimmunity, and it's your desire uh, to reduce the ability of the immune cells to stick to the endothelium. Now, the last question, it was you were trying to basically increase that because you're your patient didn't have the ability to stick. It was, your patient was deficient in those adhesion molecules at CD11A and uh, 18. In this question is just the opposite. They have autoimmune issues. In other words, you have immune cells in the wrong place. They're there, they're getting through, but you don't want them to. So the question is, how are you going to prevent them from sticking to the endothelium? So this, uh, in order to do this, you would administer a drug that blocks uh, what essentially, which cytokine. And so let's look at the answers. A, TGF beta. Well, if you block TGF beta, what would you be blocking? 
let's think about that. Cheat GF beta is gonna is gonna decrease the expression of INOS and of uh, of uh, sort of an innate immune in terms of uh, reactive oxygen species. TGF beta, what's the other thing it does? It will increase the expression of AI regs. Um, so TGF beta, okay, so it's going to increase AI regs. All right, it's going to decrease, um, you know, your reactive oxygen capability. Uh, so those two aren't going to work too well. That's essentially going to... Um, uh, you know that's not anything to do with uh, it, anything to do with adhesion. B TNF uh, TNF is a good one, right? So remember that the the, the mediators. If you're looking at firm adhesion, you've got where you've got ICAM and VCAM, TNF and IL1. Okay, are going to increase are going to increase your ICAM and VCAM. So that straight away, that's a great answer, your ICAM right there. Um, because again, you want to keep those cells from getting into the tissue because that's where they're causing damage. C is IL-5. All right, would you want to target that? That's eosinophils and IL-4 is isotype switching. So uh, to IgE, so or to pushing a TH2 response. So your best answer is going to be B, which is TNF. You'd want to target that. And again, makes sense because TNF, anti-TNF, is one of the largest selling drugs in the world. Thank you.